And so we come to the Monday of Passion Week. Yesterday was Palm Sunday, the day of the triumphal entry, when Jesus marched with palm branches on a donkey into the city and up to the temple. But in Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't do anything more on Sunday. Now, in Matthew, we get a slightly different impression. But in Mark, Jesus, it's late, and Jesus returns to Bethany. Who knows? Maybe to the home of Mary, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So then it comes Monday. On the next day, verse 12 of Matthew 11, on the next day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Verse 13, and having seen a fig tree from afar that had leaves, he came to see if he would find something on it. But having come, he found nothing except the leaves, for the time was not right for figs. Verse 14, and responding, he said, no longer forever may anyone eat fruit from you. And the disciples were listening to him. Now, our first impression is, well, what did that tree ever do to you? It's not even the right season. But hold on, there's something more going on here. We won't see it till tomorrow when we get to the Tuesday of Passion Week. But Jesus here is setting us up for a lesson that we will get when we get to tomorrow. And the lesson, the hint is here, that the fig represents that generation of Jewish leaders. So the fig tree here represents the Israel of that day. Not the Israel of all time, no, but the, the leaders and the Israel of that time. What we're going to find here is that Jesus is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, which took place in A.D. 70. And the fig tree is a representation of that. Now, the story of the fig tree actually is like the bread of a sandwich. Um, and in the middle of the, of the bread is Jesus' action in the temple, sometimes called his cleansing of the temple. And this kind of sandwich structure, we learn something from the pieces of the sandwich. The, the bread tells us about the meat, and the meat tells us about the bread. And so the fig tree story is the bread. And we've just got the top bread of the story where Jesus curses this fig tree. And the bottom part of the bread we'll see tomorrow. And this represents the destruction of Jerusalem, the judgment of Jerusalem, the judgment of that generation of, of Jewish leaders uh, for not believing in Christ and for not believing in the good news of the gospel, for not submitting to the kingdom. So, more on the fig tree tomorrow. Verse 15, and having come into Jerusalem, and having entered into the temple, Jesus began to throw out those who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers, and he overturned the seats of those who were selling doves, verse 16, and he was not allowing anyone to bring a vessel through the temple. Now, before we think, well, what happened here? Did Jesus just, did he lose it? Did he just have a, a fit of anger and he just, he went postal here? I mean, what's going on? Well, I think we should probably remember that Jesus saw this. I think we can presume that Jesus saw this on Sunday. So the action that Jesus does on Monday is a calculated action, possibly. Again, we, I'm reading between the lines, just like we all read between the lines. But Jesus is doing something here. He's not just losing his temper. That's not the point. But he, he knew that this was going on, and he thought about it. Of course, I don't, I don't know in how it all works with divine foreknowledge and all that. But this is perhaps just perhaps, a planned action, a symbolic action, an action by which Jesus is acting out a prophecy that, as we said, will take place in A.D. 70 when the Romans destroy Jerusalem and its temple. Israel has been weighed in the balance and found wanting, at least the leadership. Now, of course, there were many Jews who believed on Christ. It's not all Jews, but a preponderance of that generation, especially those in leadership, rejected the good news, rejected Christ. And so, again, I can't prove it, and I didn't come up with this, um, but it is possible that Jesus' action here is a premeditated action to symbolically indicate the coming destruction of the temple. Another argument in favor of that is that Roman soldiers stood somewhat perched 
looking for disruptions. And so if this had been a very long, prolonged disruption, then they would have swooped in and arrested Jesus on the spot. This must have been a fairly quick, fairly short action uh, that did not take place long enough uh, for the um, for the Romans to have reason to swoop in. Again, this is all guesswork. We just don't know because it doesn't tell us everything. Now, he goes on in verse 17, and Jesus was teaching and he was saying to the crowds, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all people, but you have made it into a den of thieves or a, a cave of looters? Um, and so this, this den of thieves here, as we will see in a second, is a allusion, an allusion to Jeremiah 7.11. Jeremiah 7.11 says, has this house, which is called by my name, become a, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. The context in Jeremiah 7, of course, is again the impending destruction of the temple. At that time, it was by the Babylonians. But once again, there were people who were trusting in the temple. They, God won't let his temple be destroyed. This is where he gets his mail. This is his address. This is where his name is, is, is located. And so God's not going to let the temple be destroyed. And Jeremiah, he kind of mocks that, that sentiment by saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Of course, Isaiah says that, uh, Isaiah 66 Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? Any earthly house is just a symbolic place of God's presence. God's name dwells in the heavens. God himself lives in the heavens. But those at the time of Jeremiah were trusting that God wouldn't let his temple be destroyed. And they, did, they felt like, well, we can do whatever we want. Kind of like the sons of Eli when they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Well, we're going to win if we take the Ark of the Covenant into battle. God won't let the Ark of the Covenant you know, be taken. And guess what? God really doesn't care about the Ark of the Covenant. Not that much. I mean, he does, but you know what I mean. And so in the same way, Jesus, there's, this is a, there's a richness to what Jesus does here. You have made my temple into a den of thieves, into a cave of looters. You've done it because you, the, the re religious leaders, you don't care about my people. You abuse the poor, the orphan, the widow. These are some of the same things that Jeremiah protests about. And of course, these are themes of Jesus' ministry. And, and I want to make it clear here. I can't really think of a lot of times when Jesus got upset at people because they were teaching heresy or because they're teaching bad doctrine or because they're dirty, rotten liberals. That's not what got Jesus upset. What got Jesus upset was when the marginalized were taken advantage of, when those with power abused their power on those who didn't have power. It was the women, it was the poor, it, is, it was the, the widow, it was the orphan. When these people were abused by those who had wealth, by those who had power, that's what really ticked Jesus off. And so I have to believe, you know, the symbolic action thing, it's a very plausible hypothesis, but it seems to me just as likely also, and these don't contradict each other, that Jesus was upset because these money changers were taking advantage of those who had come to worship in the temple. Now, I don't know if you've ever bought gas on a toll road or on a, on a turnpike, but I make sure to fill up with gas before I get on a toll road. Why? Because on a toll road, it's a captive audience and the gas is going to be a lot more expensive. In the old days when, where we had to exchange money before there were ATMs. Now, you know, if you're going to a foreign country, I use an ATM to, to exchange money because it cuts out the middle, the middle person who charges you their cut. At least some of the time it does. But when, in the old days of exchanging money, you were always sure to exchange your money before you went to the airport. Because if you try to exchange money at the airport, well, airports are places where you really, really need to have your money changed. At where a place of possible desperation to exchange money, and the price goes ways up, goes way up. And so it is more than plausible to me to think that these money changers were taking advantage of those who had come to buy their sheep on location, or who were, you know, and and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with the money changing in and of itself. In fact, this was a necessary function of the temple. Why? If you're coming from Rome to the temple, you're not going to bring a sheep on a ship with you or over land. You're not going to do that. No, you're going to get a sheep 
once you get to Jerusalem. And so it was necessary for people to be able to buy sheep or to buy goats or to buy whatever for doves. It was necessary for there to be this sort of money changing activity. It's not the money changing activity in itself uh, that would, would be inappropriate. It's taking advantage of those. You know, let's say you bring a sheep and they say, oh, oh, that sheep has a blemish. It won't do. Where? Where's a blemish? Right, right there. There's a blemish. I don't see any blemish. I'm sorry. I see a blemish. You're going to have to get a better sheep. And we've got a lovely deal over here on sheep for just $49.99. Um, so I have to believe that part of what really ticked Jesus off here was the abuse of the person, the common person coming to worship Jesus, coming to worship at the temple and being taken advantage of by the system of the temple. Now, there's another suggestion that's sometimes made. Mark alone, in other words, Matthew and Luke don't mention this, but Mark alone uh, in the quote, you have made my temple, uh, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people, for all people groups, for all nations. Some have suggested that the money changers had basically ignored the court of the Gentiles as an important place and had set up this money changing uh, activity in the court of the Gentiles this place that was supposed to be a place for the Gentiles to pray. And so it's possible that Jesus was upset because where they had set up their booths had, and tables had in effect made it an, a difficult for those who came from afar, Gentiles, um, to worship at the temple. And of course, Isaiah 56 is where we find this house of prayer for all people's language. Isaiah 56, verse six and seven. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and to minister him, who keep my Sabbath, who hold fast to my covenant, verse 7, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And so um, Mark, it would seem, wants us to, to see part of the problem here as the fact that they were, that because of where they had set them up, this is at least a hypothesis, where they had set up these tables was precluding the Gentiles from worshiping God, even though they wanted to. Why is it that you have made my house into a cave for violent men, for looters? Verse 18, and the high priests and the scribes were hearing and were seeing how they might destroy him, but they were fearing him, for all the crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when it became late, they began to leave out of the city. So in Mark, this is what takes place on the Monday of Passion Week. Jesus goes into the temple. He sees abuse. He overthrows these tables, which, by the way, shows that anger in and of itself is not wrong. And even Ephesians says this, in your anger, do not sin. Perhaps it was also a symbolic act, embodying the, a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus was upset at abuse, and perhaps Jesus was upset that they were hindering Gentiles from worshiping the God of Israel. So this is the Monday of Passion Week, and tomorrow we'll see what happens on the Tuesday of Passion Week.